one third of all the proteins being wiped out. So we only have two thirds of the food left to feed 10 billion people who are living in cities now. The food that you and me eat, more than 90% is actually imported. The reality for Singapore is that we are not really food secure. In this series, we'll explore how innovative technologies and local initiatives are rethinking the way we produce and consume food. Welcome to Future Food, where we explore the food production of tomorrow. To get an overview of the food landscape in Singapore, I head to ASTAR to speak to an expert. So Ming Hao, can you tell me more about what you do here and what does SIFB? Yes, SIFB. What does SIFB do? At SIFB, we do a lot of research into food, um, mm -hmm. but more specifically into future foods. So we'll try to reimagine what people would eat in future and how technology can help enable some of that. On that note, why does Singapore need to think about alternative food sources? I think the key point is that, um, you know, the, the, the food that you and me eat, more than 90% is actually imported. So the reality for Singapore is that we are not really food secure. And uh, because of that, we should invest in the ability to produce food locally um, so that we have the ability to feed ourselves should there be a time of need. So what does the future of food research look like? There'll be more and more people who are a little bit more elderly, right? Mm. So we also try and spend quite a bit of time in understanding for this uh, group of elderly population what kind of food will uh, enable them to eat better uh, instead of just drinking, you know, like milk powder and, and things which are not very delicious. So how is SIFB involved in the development and promotion of novel foods? Firstly, novel foods is a category of uh, foods that are basically not your traditional kind of food that is not like your eggs, your, your chicken, but rather, let's say, plant-based nugget, right? It's kind of a new category of food, that's why we call it novel. What SIFB is doing is um, a few things. For example, we work with uh, your polytechnics as well as your universities to better understand for this category of novel food, um, how do we improve the flavours, uh, the textures, um, as well as the nutritional profile of some of these food. But the second big category when you talk about food is that food needs to be made uh, at scale, right? Scale means like you, make to, you need to make a lot of it, you need to make it cheaply. So that's one more area which actually we're working quite closely with one of our partners, Tabasik, uh, via their subsidiary called Murasa. They have set up this entity called the Food Tech Innovation Centre. And the idea is that we are able to bring some of the technologies in the lab to uh, at least pilot and kind of test it up, right? So what are the current trends in the food landscape and what are SIFB's efforts to contribute to a sustainable future? One of the current trends, I would say, is a move towards more sustainable ways of production. Um, so an example of what SIFB is doing in this space is that we're looking at uh, food waste valorization. Valorization means how do you turn waste into things that are more valuable. The challenge there is like, you know, the, the hawker centre food that you and me eat. So how do we then work with what we call this heterogeneous waste? Means like mm. waste that is kind of, of very different in composition. Uh, how do we deal with it and in a cheap, resource efficient way, turn it into more valuable stuff? That's something that we're uh, constantly thinking about. In my quest for deeper insights, I head to the West Coast to speak with an expert who invests in food tech companies. So Kelvin, can you give me an overview of urban farming and its significance in Singapore? It's important because we are a city-state, right? Uh, we, we, our country is our city and uh, land is limited. So you need to grow it, you need to cultivate it. That's urban farming. In the Singapore context, it's been challenging to say the least, but it's not just about having the right equipment, having the right climate, but it's also about the soft skills, the ability to understand how plants grow, the ability to understand what kind of seeds work with what kind of soil conditions, or even what kind of uh, hydroponic conditions. Today, we're delving into the fascinating world of genomic agriculture, and we're headed to Singro to find out more about their climate-resistant strawberries. I'm here today with Dr. Vau, who is the founder of Singro and also an experienced researcher specialising in plant physiology and molecular biology. 
So Dr. Bao, what inspired you to start Syngro? The short answer to this uh, is I found the strawberry in Singapore market is not very tasty. So there are actually two different types of strawberries in the world. The Everbearing type, which is more commonly seen in Singapore, and the seasonal berry, which is more tasty, sweeter, but it's usually grown in Japan, uh, China, and Korea, and it's only available in certain seasons. So what are Everbearing strawberries? Everbearing type of strawberry are commonly grown in US, Australia, European countries. It has higher yield and it has a longer shelf life as well. That's why it becomes easier for long distance transportation. While for the seasonal berry strawberries, it can only grow under a temperature range of around 10 to 25 degrees Celsius. That's why in tropical countries like Singapore, we cannot really grow it under natural weather condition. So Dr. Bao, how do you modify the strawberries' DNA so they can thrive at higher temperatures? What we have been doing are called molecular breeding. What we are building is actually a platform technology. We use our deep knowledge on plant genomics. We specifically target individual genes by either crossbreeding them or use genomic technology to target that fragment. For example, for our heat resilient strawberries, by silencing that heat responsive genes, the plants will be less sensitive to the temperature change. And then we can use other ways like precision farming technology to promote the plants to start flower without really cooling down the temperature. So that's how we develop such heat resilient strawberries and this is actually the first time in the world. So I understand you guys provide a harvesting experience as well. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a lot of fun and I would love to have some hands-on experience. Yep. I've got two friends here with me, so why don't we go ahead and try some harvesting? Sure, sure. So I have Iris and Justin here with me to join me on this strawberry harvesting experience. Are you guys excited? Yes, yes. very excited. <laughs> Come on, let's go! Okay, there's a few variants of strawberries inside, mainly red and white. Across the whole farm, you can just walk around and then see what, which strawberries you want to harvest. So usually when you see a strawberry that's green, it means that it's not ripe. So for the red strawberries, right, when you see the whole strawberry itself becoming fully red, then means that they are actually fully ripened. For the white strawberry, the seeds become all red. So it's a contrast. And then this air shower will blow off the rest of the pests on the body, on the shirt. Okay, so just welcome. In this controlled environment, we control everything the plant needs, including the nutrient feeding, the water content. For example, for the control group, we gave everything perfect to the plants. Well, for the treatment group, we changed certain settings. Maybe we gave them less water content to create a drought stress to the plants. Then we further study the response from the plants. In such a way, we can measure the plant's response. And we can build up a database and digitalize this whole process. You mentioned earlier that you put the plants in different conditions. How do you measure their reactions to these conditions? We apply a set of different sensors to understand the plant response. For example, the VOC sensor or digital nose. Basically, it's a sensor that can capture the smell, the chemical compound released by the plant. So Andrew, what's a VOC sensor and what does it do? Okay, a VOC sensor is actually a volatile organic compound sensor. Okay, it senses our farms whether it's the, farm, uh, the plants are actually stressed or not. And then it just tests whether there's any pesticide used in the farm. So how does it test for stress in plants exactly? Okay, this sensor transmits all the data through cloud. And then from cloud, right, we actually have these sensors points over here. So if there's any abnormalities, like for example, some spikes may show that plants are actually stressful about maybe the water level is too high or maybe the nutrient content is too low. So they will actually show up in this manner. Mm. Is there such a thing as optimum stress level or is it just like no stress is the best? Um, no, actually plants do like stress. Like for example, we can stress them to develop more flowers. Mm -hmm. We can stress them to develop more runners and then they will just grow faster and be more resilient to other pests. 
But if you stress them out too much, they might go, I give up. Uh, or yes, something. Okay. that would be that's the way. Just, just like people. What other crops are you working on with this technology? Using these, we have been working with uh, palm oil, mango trees, many different type of fruiting trees, and uh, an interesting spice called saffron. We're able to grow saffron multiple times a year versus the natural saffron farming practice in Iran, which they can only harvest one time a year. So how does this benefit Singapore? Because we don't have uh, traditional agricultural practice, we cannot rely on a, a vast uh, scale of land to produce our food. We cannot rely on traditional agriculture sectors to feed us. We must come up with something new, uh, try to be independent from day one. So that's the good part to force us to adopt the latest knowledge and technology. It's amazing. Yeah. Stress makes us thrive, just like yes. the strawberries. Yes, exactly. That's it for today on this episode of Future Food. We have seen how genomic agriculture is helping to create sustainable food solutions right here in Singapore. From sweet strawberries to innovative farming practices, the future of food looks promising. In the next episode, we will be exploring the idea of getting protein out of thin air. Sounds intriguing? Then join us for the next episode as we delve into this groundbreaking technology to discover its potential to revolutionize food production. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time on Future Food. Stand up so how was that for you? Look at her, she's so greedy! <laughs> oh look at her, she's so productive and fruitful. <laughs> Reproductive. Reproductive. <laughs>